really like to thank our president and their colleagues, really, for putting this together. Uh, in a short space of time, um, an amazing uh, program is emerging, which, as we already heard, is going to be really unique, um, in such as no university apart from a few in the uh, United States developed something in the uh, arena, really, of um, um, body psychotherapy. They call it somatic psychology in the States. Uh, so that's going to be uh, a really fascinating, innovative um, um, uh, development. Um, I would like to also thank Professor Chilin, I hope I get the pronunciation right, really, for the very um, brief summary, really, of your reading in body psychotherapy. Um, um, it kind of sort of, sort of uh, summarized my presentation already in a nice way. Uh, so uh, well done, really, with a bit of reading, really, to grasp already the main um, uh, cornerstones, if you want to be your body psychotherapy. Um, I would uh, like Professor, the thank Professor, um, um, and it's again a difficult name, uh, Joe Jibson, I hope I get that right, so Joe Jibson, um, for um, mentioning the very fact that this is going to be a partnership, um, uh, in a way also a unique partnership symbolizing the innovative character really of the MA program. Uh, partnering two universities, particularly the University of Queen Mary, the University of London, but also an NHS and National Health Service um, um, Trust in the UK, so a healthcare provider organization. And I think that is kind of very nicely setting the scene. So, uh, in my talk, I will give an overview of the state of the art um, in body psych therapy. I will introduce it as a, as the title says, relational and embodied affect regulation therapy. And these terms will really matter really, because we already heard about the history or some of the history, historic developments, and it's otherwise very complicated to get a good overview of what body psychotherapy in a modern way really stands for. So this is going to be um, my schedule, if you want. I divide it up into um, five main themes. Um, and uh, we'll very briefly talk about um, some of the main theoretical building blocks. We'll say a few words about the historic development. That's going to be um, something which needs to be done briefly because otherwise it will take um, certainly more than an hour's time. I will talk about um, the change process, what is really happening in body psychotherapy, in um, um, differentiating it really from other forms of psychological therapy, talk therapies in particular. And I will actually also give you a quick um, summary of where we are with the evidence base. And I do hope really that by the end of my presentation you will agree with me that even though it's not so well established in the mainstream of provider care, there's good reason to believe that body psychotherapy as we go forward will be one of the main pillars really of psychological therapies. Now, the theoretical underpinning um, captures a number of relevant themes you will have heard about in different contexts for some time. Um, I think it's really important for development of psychology, just knowing that our early body or early self-development is always fully embodied. It's about some other sensory experiences uh, in um, close proximity to the caregivers, really, that uh, gives reason to formulate the first image of ourselves really in early years. So as we know, in psychological therapies, uh, we very often deal with early traumatization, we very, very often deal with people who've been through rather severe, adverse experiences in the early years of their lives, and they have difficulties to express these uh, experiences because they would actually occur at the more or less non verbal stage of their self-development. Which is why it's so important to work um, with the means really, of fully embodied experiential possibilities. Now, the second area is coming really from psychodynamic psychotherapy, we heard about the I will say a few words about it. Um, and a few concepts have been shaping within the world of psychodynamic psychotherapy related to A, the way we deal with defense mechanism. Uh, the way a transference, a counter-transference emerges, what kinds of mechanisms are uh, unfold. And we also uh, will talk about um, issues such as felt sense, the immediate ability to uh, de uh, deduct really 
meaning from our bodily sensations. And this is, I think, something Amara has just demonstrated, um, how quickly you can access um, areas of inside experience. It's when you do actually get into moving and feeling states. Effective neuroscience I can cover here, it's quite relevant as well for what sector therapy, but I will say uh, something about um, embodiment, uh, the embodied mind, which is a very significant development in the cognitive sciences. In philosophy, we hear about an activism, so which is really about a new version of um, defining the very difficult uh, tension between what is body, what is mind, what is unity in that. So there's a new uh, by a social model really emerged from there. So, if we start to point for the exploration of embodiment um, for our mental states, the question, how does it actually feature in common as well as in scientific language? Now, as you can see here with these few examples, we talk about the body that remembers, we talk about the trustworthiness of the body, the body signals, and from a psychodynamic point of view, we talk about the body as the representative really of the unconscious. This book from um, uh, by Nicole uses the term the body keeps the score. So it refers to the fact that the body remembers. The body is really the one aspect of ourselves really where uh, memory is stored on very different levels and not just really through explanations and concepts. And looking closer at the two aspects really of my initial uh, slide, the title, I uh, relational and embodied, I think it's really important to remember that we, when we talk about relational, and I think any form of psychological therapy is always relational, um, we do relate to self and others. We do um, uh, talk about our being with ourself and others, and for the purpose of engaging with the world in a meaningful way. And engaging with ourselves, engaging with others, means also using different types really, of somatic symptoms, intro and proprioception really quite closely underpinning our self-experiences as well as experiencing the world as our exoception, other somatosensory experiences. And in between, between the self and the others, um, and it means also uh, in between groups in societies, we have to regulate, so we have to constantly regulate our emotions, our, um, um, the, the way we express ourselves in um, proximity to others, and we have to regulate boundaries. We constantly oscillate between sort of the more restricted self boundary and an opening up. So we just had this uh, sharing in, 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 uh, after the experience of walking as four, and I mentioned sort of crossing boundaries as one, as one of the experiences that I came across. Because you very quickly um, get into contact with people who you don't know, who you may not really connect in any other way without um, 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 getting into some kind of an embodied being with, so moving with each other. So it just helps you to be more flexible, essentially, around your boundaries. From a communication research point of view, we know that words are often only the tip of the iceberg, really in gathering meaning in our communication. So words have been for far too long over-exaggerated. Research has actually demonstrated that uh, about 7 to 10 percent really of our actually communicated verbally content is uh, um, uh, meaningful, whereas the main messages are transported via, for example, the elements of voice, uh, intonation elements, postures, gestures, so 50% uh, expressed in body language. And that's quite a significant proportion, as you would agree with me, I suppose. And from a psychotherapeutic point of view, systematic analysis of any kind of nonverbal communication can always be entitled as relational. It's relational body language. And I think we can differentiate between two major groups of signals here, the unconscious signals of the body that captures, for example, how we react, respond uh, to persons and situations, and that means underneath the sort of a conscious control level. We um, spontaneously express our feelings, that's pretty much culturally determined. In some cultures we see a lot of that, and I 
So Italy, for example, I see always a lot of sort of hands flying when I talk to people. And we do express specific emotions with specific ways of using our body language, particularly obviously fear, tension, but also happiness. And nonverbal um, communication helps to regulate the self, again, the relation aspect to myself. We use certain gestures for soothing or reassurance purposes. And on the other side, we've got our conscious signal systems. Again, a lot of cultural variation here, but these are targeted gestures. We use facial expression to enforce particular content in our conversations. Uh, we can, for example, express our self-confidence uh, through the way we welcome somebody. A handshake can mean many different things. Uh, straight body postures, opposition and movement, all of these is a rich repertoire, really, of signaling that we always uh, embody in our communication strategies. Charlie Brown, to me, was an endless sort of inspiration, really. He kind of, sort of uh, illustrated, illustrated to me quite nicely how you can actually even utilize the really, body language in order to make a point. Uh, this is an impressed stand, it's really, really impressed. It makes a difference how you stand, of course. And the worst thing you can do is to straighten up and hold your head high because then you start to feel better again. So really, you want to be impressed and you want to be come across as impressed, this is the way you have to stand. So it's a nice thing to come to it that illustrates what I was just trying to point out. Now, body language is, um, to a relevant uh, extent, to determine our memory systems. So the two main domains, really, of memory systems need to be um, added to our theoretical repertoire in body psychotherapy. We talk about explicit, or so declarative and implicit memory systems. And the implicit memory systems are those that we work with closely in body psychotherapy. Um, it captures different aspects of your uh, biographic and other personal memories. And again, I think Amara said in exercise illustrated how you can quickly go from a personal observation of something happens to me to something which is a typical way of responding to certain situations because of the enacted nature really of what you've done. And then biographic aspects really of your own storyline begin to emerge quite quickly. And that is a major advantage essentially in body psychotherapy because it does tap into those areas really of, um, um, of information much quicker. Um, just to give you a little um, example really from literature, which is uh, a quote I really like. This is a novel from Zebald, and he writes a book called Auschwitz. And totally, as I step in uphill, step by step, feeling the uneven paving stones of the Spokova under my feet, it seems to me as if I had walked these paths before, as if something revealed itself to me not by the effort of reflection, but through my so long definite and now reawakened senses, the memory. And I think it's a, an experience you would all be familiar with, a kind of, sort of déjà vu type situation, that you tap into something which was kind of uh, forgotten about, as if it was scaffolded really away. So from a perspective of what is psychotherapy, there are, in my view, four or five main characteristics I would like to really emphasize, and we work with those in body psychotherapy. First of all, the immediateness. Words can be really going around the block really in various ways really, until you really get to the point, where there's something really immediate and um, 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 real about the way body language is communicated. It's reliable, but it's, it's much less um, questioning about sort of, the way body signals are communicated. It is emotional, much more than uh, talking, much more than any kind of theoretical um, 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 well, relating to myself and others. Uh, the emotional tone always shines through. And there's a degree of natural authenticity. Authenticity is something that therapists by are not always seeking to identify, because authenticity leads to the person in a straight way. So many of the psychological work in home therapy is trying to really take away all the kind of sort of um, 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 the cluttering really around 
the, the authentic message. And I think this is a nice little image that illustrates what I'm trying to talk about here. So, I suppose you can agree with me that sometimes um, words are actually taking the storylines away from where you really want it to be. Um, there's another aspect that uh, we briefly um, um, heard about this morning, and that's touch. It's a very controversial, um, probably the one of the most controversial um, topics we need in psychological therapy. But again, the little exercise we've been through really um, tells you something about uh, how powerful touch is and what different types of issues it can evoke. We say, for example, in our common language, I feel touched, this is very touching, which is saying, well, this gets close to me. This is sort of really reaching me. We say we lay fingers on wounds, so we do actually physically and symbolically get to our um, um, uh, difficult um, points really in, in our self experiences. I mentioned how essential any touch is for early self development, and it's an actual, genuine, or spontaneous expression of relating to others. Empathy is always expressed through some form of touch. In its um, uh, overarching version, any form of nonverbal communication, but it also taps very closely into uh, social and cultural rituals. So you will obviously different cultures find very different ways of um, uh, embedding touch really within um, the social uh, context, the social shakeup really of communities. And it's important to know about those because there's a lot of uh, information contained really in those rituals. From a neurobiology point of view, I'm, I'm a doctor, as you heard, I mean, these things matter to me. It's important to know that the skin is actually the largest of our sensory organs, and there's a very close link to a particular hormone, it's relevant right, for attachment, for bonding, which is oxytocin. So touch is immediately stimulate oxytocin release, so it's something that um, our neuroscience research at the moment is really trying to better understand in terms of the interface between body, mind, processes. Not to forget that touch is, uh, as I said, controversial, so it can do good or harm, and it very much depends on the context, the attitude, and the intentions. But it's something I think has been systematically neglected in uh, psychological therapy for too long, and there's uh, um, rich wisdom there. And again, um, my identity as a doctor, just really very briefly flagging up the very fact that body language does, of course, also mean all our bodily systems. All our bodily systems are always engaged in our communication. This is a slide that comes from um, Daisy Fancourt, who is a researcher who tries to understand the effects of music therapy uh, on psychological processes. Uh, but you can really easily replace music by um, embodiment or um, embodied engagement. And you can see how um, all the bodily systems actually um, in the frame. On the physical level we see the pulse rate changing, the breathing pattern, blood pressure can change, the skin temperature, neuro uh, endocrine system, so the leukocytes and cytokines in our system that responds to social contexts. And on the personal level, in particular relevant, the stress and warning uh, systems. All of that interplays obviously with our way of body being and are important sources of information for psychological therapy. So that takes me to my second point, a few brief notes really about historic developments um, um, in terms of the body and psychotherapy in general. So this is a wonderful book for those who um, have an interest in psychoanalysis, psychodynamic um, theory, written by Perry and Alicia who uh, essentially investigated in this book how the body featured in psychoanalytic theory and practice and what she's essentially pointing out is um, trying to understand why physicality has been essentially eliminated from the therapy room all the time in psychoanalysis. Even though, one shouldn't forget, Freud originally conceptualized um, psychoanalysis really as a form of psychosomatic uh, scientific discipline. Freud very clearly understood at the very beginning really of his theory gathering that the psychodynamic processes cannot be understood without a body context. So, um, this is a quote from the book, 
which I find really um, helpful in terms of the theoretical underpinning also for body psychotherapy, because she, she just really emphasizes that each reconstruction of any matter theory in psychological therapy carries slightly different implications for the, for the body. Each mind body solution implies something about the source of the animating, generative, and motivating energy of life. And I think that so very nicely points towards the fact that we are living species and that we are fully embodied species at any moment in time. Um, and this is why we've seen, really, as you, um, well, as this slide tries to summarize, over the years, really, a plethora of approaches, really, to bring the body back into psychological therapy after psychoanalysis eliminated it and after the, the B in cognitive behavioral therapy, the behavior element has also been uh, significantly neglected. So, this is just to show you there are a number of different routes leading into um, body psychotherapy historically. A lot of debate coming from uh, philosophical theories, obviously um, uh, issues of society and nature are relevant. I mentioned the um, um, developments in psychoanalysis, but also then in the 70s of the last century, the human potential movement, human, humanistic psychology brought a very new emphasis we've got here now on experiential uh, issues in, in psychotherapy. But then there were also other developments that come together really in modern body, or, or let's say body-oriented psychological therapy, as you will see on the next slide, coming from pedagogic movements where it was all about sort of trying to find healthy lifestyles, um, and or from arts, particularly obviously um, dance and theatre work. So what about Bill and Wright? We heard about Bill and Wright being one of the founders really of body psychotherapy and even though that um, is probably uh, already challenged to certain extent these days with the overarching relative of body oriented work, I think his contribution was so significant that it's worth mentioning. Because he started to emphasize um, resistance um, um, and not really going to the immediate interpretations, the understanding process of psychoanalysis. And in doing so, he observed that any kind of character or attitude was always accompanied by specific bodily postures. And that in itself led to the development really of a key understanding really how personality, how defense, how uh, specific um, um, adjustment reactions are actually shaped within the body as well. And that obviously leads then to a conclusion that in order to uh, change those, that you need to work directly with and through the body as well. So this is another um, way of conceptualizing modern body psychotherapy and to differentiate, if you want, between sort of three groups. In the middle, we have what comes out of right, the body psychotherapy core group. Uh, on the uh, right side, we've got the dance therapies, and on the left, for functional uh, movement-oriented therapies. And they all overlap, obviously, quite significantly, but they have a slightly different focus, really, in terms of working with perception, working with emotion, working with um, creative conversation. Um, that's for, obviously, our oh, main cause to explore in more details. But my final slide in terms of the history here, so we could um, um, argue that a new umbrella term for what we are um, uh, bringing about through the master program could also be body-oriented and body psychological therapies, with body psychotherapy, psychological therapy, and dance movement being the three major branches of that. I think we should mention the fact that body psychotherapy is um, becoming more and more accepted, prevalent across the board of psychological therapies, without explicitly always saying so. Uh, there's a branch in psychoanalysis, not called analytical body psychotherapy, it's particularly a group of some Austrian colleagues, Peter Geisler and others. We've seen in cognitive behavior therapy developments towards a body-oriented version. Two textbooks uh, by now published in, in, in German uh, in intensive body psychotherapy, psychotherapy, very often a neglected sort of integration of specific techniques. And there are uh, a number of associated fields for body psychotherapy, such as play therapy, psychodrama, and also the arts therapy. 
So, my third point. Um, this is really important because it's such a difficult notion to get away from, Descartes, really. Um, something we grew up with, it's sort of part of our more or less sort of, sort of genetic mind, I would say. It's very difficult to step really out of this uh, dualistic model. But in, in, in the recent years, we've seen quite a lot of publications really emphasizing the embodied cognition. Um, um, virtually, we've got the, the old term biopsychosocial. And um, this and effective neuroscience have really challenged the old kind of top down notion, really, of what mind is about. Yeah? And um, a few um, thoughts, really, from that field I would like to introduce here. Yeah? So first of all, the term ambiguity. Ambiguity, uh, a term framed by Malcolm T, French philosopher, and it really, in my understanding, describes this um, existential dilemma we have as humans. Uh, we're always in between these two powers. The objective, I have a body, and the subjective, I am a body. And the body is kind of a constant sound of end, end, end point at the same time, you have all our doing, being, experiencing. And, um, and we are the only species, really, who can anticipate uh, its own end, its own ending with death. So I think there is an existential dilemma we all work with, and we don't really appreciate that in psychological therapy. I think we miss a very important point, really, in terms of the various sources of suffering that human bring to its brain psychotherapy. There's a few relevant statements, really, coming from the body cognitive sciences. First of all, we talk about an extended mind, so the mind is really not anymore just in the brain or in me, in my psyche. It's everything, it's thoughts, feelings and behaviours, and that grounded in our interactions with the environment. It's only this way we can understand the mind. That means any kind of cognition is always for action. So cognition is not just, just there as a Laugh for laughs so of I'm sort of thinking for myself and, and uh, I'll see what kind of playfulness comes out of it. Thinking cognition is always sort of geared towards acting, and even our offline cognition is rooted in the body. The third main statement is that movement is an active, that means we experience the world through participating meaning making. We don't experience the world in just really looking through a sort of screen as uh, our new technologies pretend. Um, so we experience the world when we touch it, when we smell it, when we hear it. Um, and then we can actually enrich that information with what we also see through a um, screen. And that's important because, as I said, psychotherapy like is relational. It's always people engaging with each other. There's something happening in that relation. And Sean Gallagher, one philosopher, wrote a very uh, amazing book it's called How the Body Shapes the Mind. He writes about this as a direct understanding of another person's intentions as explicitly expressed in their embodied actions and mirrored in our own capabilities for action. So we talk about common sense, felt sense, intuition, all these processes. But what it really means is that there is already a process at stake when we engage that mimics the actions of others in our own minds. And the mirror neuron research really seems to be giving us a kind of sort of neurobiological place really where this happens. And this is related to what we already know about the importance of emotions for our movement behavior. So implicit memories in the system I mentioned earlier on, it's the main memory system we work with in body psychotherapy. It's embedded in, in our emotional responses. And this, in turn, is always linked with movements. And the last focus, for example, one of the researchers who very thoroughly investigates movement behavior. And this is quote from her body movements affect cognitive and emotional processes. It promotes communication and it regulates interaction. So, why should we? Let me leave it out of the therapy room when it's so rich, when it's so powerful in changing essentially interactions. There are a lot of experiments that have demonstrated essentially that certain bodily states can 
have strong influences uh, on our social warmth, such, such as, for example, friendliness and, and helpfulness. Uh, I remember one experiment I read about recently where they, they were trying to figure really how, um, um, how prepared are people to give away, to give presents, to make gifts to others. And they put the people through an experiment where they were holding a cold glass and a warmed up glass. And the percentage really of those who actually uh, were willing to, to, to give a gift away to others really dropped from 75 to 25 percent, really, just in that little experiment. So there's some amazing findings in, in um, um, neuropsychology. One of those is this study, it's actually quite a famous study um, uh, from um, a group who tried to understand really how pain is processed in the brain. And pain, as you know, is a term that we use for any kind of pain, you know, for both social as well as physical pain. And this was an experiment where they uh, applied uh, thermal pain to the skin, and um, um, it was a crossover design, and exposed people to social deprivations of uh, situations, causing emotional pain. And what they demonstrated is that the brain doesn't really make any difference. Yeah? The, the, the pain is just processed in the same way in the um, um, neurotic, uh, the, in the neurosis circuitry as social pain. So, closing this off really, I think there is um, uh, what we see in what is psychotherapy, it's some kind of a new triangulation really happening for a new meta theory um, that translates into um, uh, the body psychotherapy work. So it's always triangulated with the actual body, anything that the body, the body brings, uh, brings uh, uh, along. Our inner world of self experiences and the environment um, in that kind of inseparable cycle. Um, now, starting to translate that really into the world of psychotherapy, I think we need a different understanding really of change processes. Um, we have two prevailing models of change processes at the moment in, in, in psychotherapy. We have the understanding model, come from the psychodynamic background, understanding the need to change. And we have the kind of sort of, if you want, reprogramming model, you can sort of change your cognitive programs through um, CBT. But this is pointing to a different model. And this is uh, quoting Alicia again. Change processes are not the result of making the unconscious content conscious by means of insight. Rather, key components of change occur in areas of procedural and implicit memory that may never be the direct subject of the verbal exchanges in therapeutic interactions. There's a completely new paradigm really for change processes in psychological therapy. So I'm going to talk about those change processes now a little bit um, more detail in terms of what is really happening, what's the mode of action, what is it mm. Let me start with a quote, um, even though not capturing all aspects we spoke about, but I think it's a good starting point because it points towards the fact that, going back again to my initial slide, this is about regulation, modulation, transformation. So the change processes in a fully embodied way will really change the way we regulate in relation to self and others. And the fundamental premise, like starting in body psychotherapy, is that our core beliefs are embodied. And that until we begin to experience the pain held in them directly through our bodies, they will continue to run our lives. And that's what we very often see when People come after um, uh, different uh, journeys through psychological therapies to an experiential form of psychotherapy. That the pain kind of, sort of is dealt with on a, on a different level and becomes more accessible for that reason. But how do body experiences and movement actually matter for any kind of transformation processes? I'm going to list just a few examples. Well, first of all, our body experiences and our movements, as we heard, are reflecting and affecting cognition. So they always mirror off our cognition, our emotions, our perception. At the same time, they modulate them. 
We heard that self-touch serves to stabilize. It's important for self-exploration. And movements have sort of regulatory potentials, um, restructure interactions, all of that is at the core of any kind of relation or form of psychotherapy. We shouldn't forget about another important aspect that this brings really to the portfolio of therapists because the history of psychological therapies is predominantly the history of working with deficits. And it's really daunting really for people who come to psychotherapy to just be go through a long process really of working with all the things that don't work well in me and with me. What is is um, um, it's a form of therapy that engages people's resources, capabilities and skills from the very beginning. So it's very, very important for self-management. Grounding is a concept coming from psychotherapy, which is about using the smart sensory systems really to explore the world, to really check out the, my perception of the world is really the world around me. We did a wonderful exercise again with Amara where we started off kind of using our senses and do exactly that at a very simplistic level. And the profound um, um, ability of grounding for reality testing uh, is something that is really important in psychotherapy. And we also work with what's called scenic enactments because they can tap in our implicit memory into our implicit memory system. So, we use role play, we, we start to um, test out really how specific biographic memories are actually expressed in my movement behavior and the way I posture myself. And changing that um, taps both into memories but also gives people opportunities to already test new ways of relating to my problem. This is a book that's unfortunately not yet translated. For me, it's the most groundbreaking sort of theory textbook in what is psychotherapy that we've seen so far. This is Ulf Goethe, German what is psychotherapist who published essentially two books. This is um, the most recent one. And he defines 10 principles of practice really in what is psychotherapy. We don't have the time to go into those, but I wanted to flag them up really as just the main themes there perception, feeling states, we heard about the immediateness. It's about exploration of yourself on different levels. Activation is quite relevant, um, touching and holding. We spoke about the enacting. And really, for me, it boils down to the final one, the regulation and modulation principle. So, this is um, something I've been working on for a little while now. Uh, being a psychiatrist and a um, I was trying to really reconcile these two positions because in psychiatry what happens is people are getting diagnosed and diagnosed very often unfortunately are just the descriptive labels really of symptom clusters and they mean more or less nothing. So that means it's very difficult to deduct any kind of therapeutic um, implication from a diagnosis. But coming from a psychotherapy perspective what I've been observing really for the last 10, uh, 15 years is that certain uh, mental um, disorders cluster around a specific way of embodiment. So for example, there are disorders such as depression, anxiety, somatoform, so this post-traumatic stress disorder where the body features really as a source of suffering. It becomes almost a burden within the sphere of certain experience of patients. On the other side, of a lot of research in psychosis, you will find a high poor in body regulation. The body is more or less absent, it becomes disintegrated. Patients describe feelings of um, um, uh, fleeting bodies, as if the body kind of dissociates from themselves. And then you have the personality disorders in the middle, where the body is often instrumentalized really, for certain purposes. So it's uh, um, Place of self harming, body manipulations, rituals take place. And that is a very helpful conceptualization, really, to start some research because then you can actually explore how research can make a difference in these specific disorders. So, a couple of examples when we talk about hyper embodied dysregulation, we want to do some rebalancing and work with negative body self images. We try to bring in autonomous basic functions into the work. We work with what's called symbolic fulfillment in, in psychotherapy. I mean, if somebody has been depraved of any kind of warmth, uh, um, 
a, a, a protective parenting really figure where anything was communicated as so something along the lines of I can trust uh, the other. This cannot be spoken about, it cannot be eradicated just in talking therapies. There must be a fundamental experience of a touch that is actually caring, that is actually nurturing, that is actually positive environment. These things can happen in voice and therapy. We can work with counter-regulation, regulating these um, patterns really in terms of using specific movements. And we can also work against this gravity, the body is a burden really. You know? So literally and symbolically, it's kind of, sort of uh, best phrase is I feel stuck. Let's get me out of here, out of the morass of my bad feelings. So the other side in high poor embodied dysregulation, so for example in psychosis, we work and we means it's been explored in, in research with manuals, uh, with grounding for example, creating new anchor points for reality testing for these patients. We use ego consolidation to articulate agency, boundaries, and physical uh, connection with internal and external worlds. We use it as building blocks for communication and for self exploration. And that takes me to my final um, part. So uh, it's all good saying, really, but without evidence, um, it, it's just um, kind of uh, an interesting storyline. But as I promised you early on, I uh, will also uh, demonstrate some emerging evidence base really for these approaches in, in psychotherapy. Um, first, I want to mention um, that in psychotherapy research, there's different ways of going about really the outcomes. You can obviously study uh, just symptom um, improvement, for example, depression. They use a scale to measure really how sad, hopeless. Um, restricted as a person, but you can also use secondary outcomes that are closer to what you are trying to achieve in a wider scheme of things in terms of personal and self-development. For example, the body image is a very important aspect that can be changed and that has uh, implications on how successful symptoms can be uh, addressed. So there's a lot of research out there that does that and describes a pattern of body image disturbances in different diagnostic groups describes ways of non-verbal communication and so on and so forth. So the first example to mention, this is, um, these are all examples of our research group, um, partially in collaboration with other international groups. Uh, this was a trial um, on polypsychotherapy for chronic depression. Um, now, these patients, the, the inclusion criteria for these patients were that they had at least two years of chronic depression at a level that required them to be in constant therapy. They had uh, four to six, on average, five different antidepressants, courses of antidepressant treatment with medication, and they all had two different types of um, psychological therapy already uh, tried and were still chronically depressed. And we saw a significant effect of your body psychotherapy, uh, which we then also investigated on the process that we um, used what's called mixed method um, design. And we could essentially describe that any kind of clinically relevant changes in um, um, depressive symptoms was related to two, two aspects, really, two psychological aspects, feelings of empowerment and the ability to reconnect with the, the uh, emotions of repressed anger, which was a very uh, important um, aspect really of the, the, the manual as well that we delivered for these patients. Um, and it points really towards the fact that polypsychotherapy therapy can actually reach out to patients where other therapies seem to have its limitations. There was a recent meta-analysis of all the studies that have been published on chronic depression. There was only 20 studies that reached that level that they were regarded as constituting the evidence base, and this study is one of those. Uh, second example, um, I'm going to skip this is um, psychosis, schizophrenia, and you can see that in our research we've been trying to essentially get that to reach out to um, patient groups where um, a lot of uh, difficulties are still in the clinical arena where uh, treatments are not very successful. And we found a very significant effect really of our body psychotherapy on these so-called negative symptoms and patients' abilities to 
uh, expressed their emotions, that was the particular change process for these patients. That in turn enabled them to become more socially um, um, inclusive, less socially isolated. And the third um, example is this um, somatoform disorder of patients, um, or so called medically unexplained symptoms. This is a massive health problem across the globe. There are um, epidemiological figures suggesting that about a third to every um, second consultation in primary care is about medically unexplained symptoms. Patients come to see doctors with um, somatic complaints, and doctors can't find any organic. Uh, the reason for that. You know. It costs the healthcare across all countries a lot of money. And uh, we've done a lot of work in this particular uh, arena over the last few years. And the top study that just been published in the human disability uh, randomized control study, which again showed uh, not only that therapy was effective, but it reduced costs because it stopped patients from going from one examination to the other. Right, and that takes me already to the end, which is my summary, uh, and that's really my summary uh, in terms of what I think voice like therapy is. I hope that you've seen that it's not just a technique, it's just touching or moving, and uh, it's also not attempting to eliminate talking in psychotherapy. Talking is a very essential aspect of all psychotherapies that happens. Uh, Integrally, body psychotherapy as well, because we need narratives, we need our uh, cognitive understanding as well. So it's not really aimed to replace, but enrich the fields of other psychological therapies. Positively speaking, it is a systematic approach of working with and through embodiment in psychotherapeutic practice. And it's also an evidence based approach of disorder specific therapeutic interventions. It is, as I said uh, at the very beginning, a modern relation of affect regulation therapy, and uh, it is really expert at its core. So the experience is matter, which is why the marrow has to be introduction into, well, you have to do that in order to get the gist of it, is, is a really key message. So you could, for example, as a cognitive behavior therapy, just learn how to do things to others. You have to experience it in, in, in your own self. So if you're interested to read more about body psychotherapy, we now have this wonderful handbook um, uh, translated into English. Um, it's been updated uh, since. Um, and on the right, it's one of my publications, uh, giving a bit of an overview really of what body psychotherapy means for severe mental illness. And that leads me, obviously, to this very exciting uh, development. Um, I think. Um, um, it's really bravery for my different university to pick up something which is so innovative, which is still perceived as um, being somehow niche, even though I can assure you with more than 20 years of practice in this field it isn't. But it will be the first of its kind, and so I think if you are paying your part for any year, this one will be for a very exciting development, and I'm really proud to be part of this. And um, I thank you for your attention.